what's right been in youtube long time no see it's been about six months uh, right now it's early may 2022 as you can see from behind me we're at the very end of our dry season water tables down we've had a few good rains actually this past week but otherwise we're really dry um, we finished a pretty cold uh, winter season relatively for, for this area and I'm back here on this project. The last video that I did was the installation back in November. We're here, it's in May, about six months later. And I'm gonna show you the update and I think you're gonna like what you see. All right, so this is the driveway to the house. And if you remember, we had concentric rings which was the pattern of the uh, agroforestry system. So here's one of the outer rings. There's another ring, there's another ring. Same thing over here, ring. Basically ar arcs or arches, they're all parallel. They're equal, equal distance apart. Each line is 30 feet apart and there's various fruit trees in here, which I explained in a previous video. But one of the things that I'm really excited about, first of all, is how quickly things are growing. Here we've got guavas, we've got pigeon pea, cassava, carimbia, pigeon pea, banana. Everything's growing really well. There's a uh, jack bean in there. And we're actually putting more seeds in because there's a few spots where we've noticed the, the original cover crop species have already died back, mostly because of the winter season. There's an ice cream bean tree com coming up in there. What I'm really impressed with here is the, uh, the fact that everything just cruised through this cold weather. So for those of you that don't live in Florida or Southwest Florida, you maybe you didn't notice, but we had some of the coldest weather this winter that we've had in about a decade. My farm, I think we got down just below freezing, but just a little bit inland. And down here, they were, they were into the upper 20s and some places they're even in the mid 20s. But that didn't seem to stop anybody here. Here we've got baby mango trees. We've got bananas, we've got baby mangoes. You'll see there's a pattern here, banana, baby mango, banana. And this stuff cruised right through some relatively cold weather. And there's a few reasons for that. The first reason is the windbreak that we put up. The windbreak is going on two years old now. The north side, which is the most important side for windbreak effect, is about 20 feet tall. It still has some room to grow. It's gonna, it should top out around 40 feet. It's that sea breeze bamboo. That was a really important element to this design because it does buffer those colder winds that come from the north when we have the cold fronts on the other side of the bamboo is just a big open field another really important element that kept us from freezing is the irrigation system these jets were running all night for those two cold nights and as you can see there was no damage on these mangoes and then the final piece is the companion planting here we have pigeon pea right behind it is carimbia torelliana there's bananas, there's jack bean right there. That's a new pigeon pea, we had to replace one that didn't make it here. More carimbia, more bananas. These other species help to buffer the temperatures. They provide a little bit of shade, they catch the frost. If there's, if there's gonna be a frost, it's usually gonna land on, the, on what's the outer, the outer leaves. It doesn't usually land underneath the canopy. So if you can get a little canopy over top of your little baby trees, sometimes that can be really helpful. Uh, you'll notice a lot of times when, the, when a tree does have frost burn or freeze effects it's always on the tips usually that's because the tips are where the new growth is so it's more tender and also that's where the frost lands and settles and sits usually the interior of the canopy as well as the interior of the forest is going to be more moderated and the temperature is not going to swing as high and as low and you guys can probably imagine how that would work but those are the things that cruised us right through the cold and you know this is we're pushing pushing the zone a little bit here this is a zone 10 or no this is a zone 9b and we've got dozens of mangoes here there's sapodillas or sapodillas however you like to say it uh, we've got a number of different types of anona here we've got longans we've got even got coconuts coconuts weren't damaged some of that may be local luck we might have just somehow gotten missed but I've, i know people that live very close by that had a lot more damage than they had here. I think the irrigation was probably the biggest element, but overall, it looks pretty good. All right, so let's talk about what we're doing now. Because we weren't here for about six months, there was time for some of the grass to grow into the mulch. A lot of that grass came with the mulch because it was an old mulch pile and when we were scooping it out, we were pulling little, little bits of rhizome 
putting them into the bed and then of course they proliferate. Now ideally, we would have been out here, you know, two, three, four weeks afterwards and we could have picked that grass when it was young, covered it over if there were any spots that were, that were showing more tendency to, to grow through. But that wasn't the case. The, the owner was busy. I haven't been really busy and, and so we're having to do a big catch up right now. So what we're doing now is pulling that grass out, laying it out into the, into the edges, and then we're actually collecting grass from the pasture on the other side of the windbreak to suppress what's here. Let me show you that. So when we came here last week for the follow-up consultation, uh, we saw the grass that was growing in the beds. And the first thing I thought was, hey, what if we uh, use some of this here hay? The, uh, the owner had just had most of this pasture mowed. And uh, what we did was we brought over my belt rake, which you may have seen in a previous video. We raked up all the grass, we're piling it up, and now we're gonna use this on our tree lines to help suppress the living grass with the dead grass. This is a pretty, pretty awesome idea, pretty awesome uh, concept. I wanna give credit to uh, Scott Hall. He's been developing a site that I've been following out there in Australia. And he's actually started with a pasture and his grass management is how he's starting his tree lines. Um, he's not importing mulch, which I think is a really cool idea. And having done this now, I think if you had a larger piece of pasture like this and some planning and the right tools, I think you could probably start your forest um, without importing mulch. I think you could just produce your own on site. And I think that's a really exciting way to approach things, especially when you start to scale up into different size projects, because moving the mulch, you know, it's just time consuming, it's heavy, it's expensive, or it can be expensive. Nice thing about the hay is that it's gonna grow right back and it's light. This is actually really easy for us to move around. It's not killing anybody. You know, we're not breaking our backs out here today. We're just kind of pushing it up into a trailer, bringing it over there, unloading it by hand, and um, it's working out really well. And I think this is something that could be replicated all over the place. All right, so let's talk about the strategy moving forward. We're about that close to the rainy season and the grass is gonna just start pumping. Really everything's gonna start pumping if it isn't already. Um, so what we've done is taken the grass from over in the pasture and we're piling it up nice and high to suppress the weed pressure that we've had. Um, we're leaving the midlines open and we've actually just gone through and replanted. Some of the pigeon peas didn't take on the first try. We replanted some of the ones that were missing. We're putting in new seeds of jack bean Albizia, Lucena, um, and a couple other nitrogen fixing species. All of them being put in as a service species. What we're trying to do is fill that line all the way up. And then as Scott likes to say, and I like to copy <laughs> people that have good ideas, we manage by pruning. So once everything comes up, then we have all these options. We can cut things out that are in the way. We can pre preferentially prune to, to create a stratification and also to favor the species that we're trying to encourage to grow long-term. Um, the strategy that I've come up with here, because we want to protect our edges, like I said before, we, we've been pulling the grass away from the edge. I've actually run my tiller through on both sides of these beds. As you can see here, we've run the tiller through and what we're going to do is cover crop with seed on both on the sides. And so what you're seeing here, this will be a drive path and then you're gonna have cover crop on both sides. It's gonna be a summer crop, so it's only gonna come up, fill in and dominate the area through the summer. And then we're gonna cut it and then rake it and even add it onto this edge. And so what we're trying to do is dominate and shade out this rhizobial grass that's trying to, trying to run through all this area. Um, we'll see how that goes. I think, I think the grass is gonna be pretty aggressive, but we have a pretty never ending supply of this, this hay and we're gonna do, a, do our best to go ahead and shade it out before the rainy season hits here. So as you can see, we're about two thirds of the way done putting this grass down. We still got a little bit ways to go, but I just wanted to give you guys an update on where we're at and uh, bring you along on this journey. Uh, we've got other projects going on, but I wanted to make sure we at least documented this one because I already had a before, a before uh, video of it so you can see it. And uh, we'll try to get some more updates as we move forward. If you guys liked the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more and we'll see you next time.